Hello everyone and welcome to another Lens Studio tutorial. In this video we are going to go through the new material editor which enables us to create some really cool procedural effects that will take your lenses to the next level. Now I've gotten a lot of requests to make a video that goes through the basics of the material editor which is understandable. Shaders can seem pretty intimidating if you're like me and have never even heard of them before they were introduced in Lens Studio. The good news is, like any skill, they get easier the more you practice. Now when I was starting to learn what shaders even are, I asked some of the other creators and multiple people pointed me to a very useful website called thebookofshaders.com. This site lays out an easy way to learn the underlying concepts that give you a general understanding of what exactly is happening in your shaders. Which leads us to the burning question, what the fuck is a shader? Let's think of it this way. Imagine a Rubik's Cube. It has six sides, each a different color. On each side, there are nine subsections, or in this case, we'll call them pixels. These nine pixels on each side of the cube make up the color of the entire object. Now with shaders, we're able to change what each pixel shows, whether that's color or texture. Now let's think three-dimensional. On every vertex, there are four corners, or vertices. Each vertex on every pixel on every side defines that cube's shape. Shaders allow us to change every vertex. This means that we can not only add some really cool color effects to our objects, but we can also change their shape. So let's jump into the material editor and get a feel for the controls. To start, click add new in the resources panel and scroll down to the materials. You'll see that there are the standard materials that have always been there, but now there are a few more custom materials like gold or glass. Below these, you'll see the graph section. Let's start by creating an empty graph and creating a sphere in our scene. And then let's apply this new empty graph material to the sphere so that we can preview what we're doing in real time. We can go into the material editor in Windows, Panel, Material Editor, or just by double clicking on the new empty material. Now that we're in the material editor panel, we can see that there's just a single node, the shader output. This is where all the effects will ultimately end up connected to, whether they're color pixel effects or vertex effects changing the shape. Right now, all we have is a white sphere, so let's change the color by adding a color parameter node. We can either click add node on the top left or click tab on our keyboard and it'll open up the node menu. From here, we can just type color until we see the color parameter show up and select that. Now we can wire this into the shader color and we'll see that the parameter shows up in the inspector panel and we can easily change it. So this color is kind of boring. Let's add a 2D texture instead. Now we have a cool space texture for our sphere, but what if we try multiplying this texture by the color? We can create a multiply node and wire the color and texture parameters to it and then wire the output to the shader. So this looks cool, but what if we want the shader to look more realistic with lighting effects? This is especially useful when we're using normal maps and specular maps with our 3D objects. To do this, we can create a PBR node and attach that between the multiply node and the shader node. Instead of just rewiring, we can hold the shift key, then drag the PBR node into that wire connection. Now with the PBR node connected, we can see that it has a shiny material that looks more realistic. We can even fine tune the values inside the node or create some parameters to easily adjust them on the fly in the inspector panel. Now's a good time to mention that it's a good idea to name all of your parameter nodes for easier access in the inspector. One thing you'll notice when creating shaders is that a lot of values range from 0 to 1. With RGB color, 0 represents black and 1 represents white. It's the same with the metallic and the roughness values in this PBR node. So we can change each of these float parameters to have a minimum of 0 and a maximum of 1 so that the slider will be created and we can more easily adjust these values in the inspector. A lot of time spent building shaders is just playing around with different nodes and seeing what combinations and settings look the best. Like for example, I think this would look cool with some noise attached. 
Now noise is a way of adding a sort of procedural randomness to our effects. The best way to explain this is to just show you by creating a noise node. We'll start with simplex noise. Let's just attach this to the color output and see what it looks like. Okay, so nothing special is happening. This is because we haven't told the node where the noise will be placed on the surface of the object. This is done using UV coordinates, which are X and Y values that are, again, between 0 and 1. Let's create a surface UV node and attach that to the seat of the noise. And now we're getting more of a visual of our noise. So let's add a float parameter to more easily adjust the scale of the noise, and let's call that simplex scale. Since the scale values are a vector 2, we can easily change the channel to XY so that it matches the vector 2 input. And now we can adjust the values of the X and the Y scale. I think the noise looks boring just sitting still, so let's scroll the UV coordinates of the noise to move it. We can add a scroll coordinates node in between the surface UV node and the noise, and see how it starts spinning out of control. Let's create another float parameter and call it simplex speed to control that better. There, that looks pretty cool. Now what if we try combining this with our other texture output? Let's create another multiply node and attach that to the output we had before. Hmm, that doesn't really look as cool as I thought. If you played with Lens Studio's blend modes in the past, you'll recognize the multiply effects from there. We can see how it ignores the lighter colors and shows more of the darker ones. Conversely, the add blend modes typically did the opposite and showed more of the lighter colors. So let's try rewiring these to blend them together better. Instead of multiplying the color to the texture, let's multiply the color by the noise. Then, if we add the texture into this new output, we can actually see the blue colors on the noise. As you use the material editor more, you'll start seeing common nodes that are used, like the multiply and the add nodes to blend stuff together. Another useful node is the power node. Now this is commonly used after noise to control its intensity. Let's try that out by inserting a power node right after the noise node and creating an intensity float parameter to attach to the exponent. One cool thing to note is that you can preview each individual node by hovering over it and pressing P on the keyboard. This is an excellent way to debug your shader and see where something is going wrong. Alrighty, so now that we have a cool scrolling noise effect, let's try adding some more noise, this time Voronoi noise. We can attach the same surface UV node to this seed and create another float parameter for the scale. Now you'll probably notice that our inspector is getting pretty crowded with parameters. One useful feature is that we can group our parameters together for better organization. So let's group all of our simplex noise parameters together by typing simplex in the group line for every one. We can then do the same for all of our Voronoi parameters. We won't see the parameters or the previews for the Voronoi noise show up until we connect it to the output. So let's try adding these together. Now Voronoi noise is a little bit different than simplex noise in that each of these individual cells are actually independently moving based on the offset number. If we add an elapsed time node and control that with a speed parameter, you'll see how they move around almost as if they're alive. This can create some really cool dynamic effects. One little finishing touch to this noise effect would be a rim effect. Let's add a rim node and then multiply a new color parameter in with it and then add that to our final output to the PBR. We could create parameter nodes for the rim values, but since we'll only adjust this once, we could just click on the node and edit it inside this window. When we're done, we can just drag that closed. So now we have a great color effect with our shader, but I think it'd be cool to add some vertex distortion based on the noise pattern. To do this, we need to get the output of the black and white noise textures added together, which we can easily find by previewing each node. We will then need to multiply that by a float that we'll call vertex strength. This is going to be the value that controls how much the vertices are distorted. We'll need to get the vertices current positions on the object, so we'll create a surface position node and add that to the vertex multiply node and then output that to the world position of the shader node. 
And now you can see that the sphere's shape is actually moving based on that noise. This is just one way that you can alter the vertices on your 3D objects. There are many other ways. You'll notice how the more that we increase the vertex distortion, the more that there are jagged edges and part of the mesh that are breaking. And this is due to a 3D mesh with a low amount of vertices. If you want a more realistic distortion effect, you'll need to make sure that your 3D meshes have a high vertex count, while still keeping it within Lens Studio's limits. If you're ever looking for inspiration on what you can do with shaders, you should definitely check out the Material Editor template. It has a bunch of great examples, a lot of which you can just put directly on your objects. For example, I really like the iridescence effect, and I want to add it to this cute little red panda animation. So you'll see that when we add the iridescence material to the panda mesh, the texture is lost. Luckily, we can edit the shader to include the texture. So let's double click on the iridescence material to open the editor. It looks like they created a whole subgraph for this iridescence effect. Subgraphs are essentially a bunch of nodes grouped together so that you can keep your graphs smaller and more organized. You can double click to jump inside a graph and then click on the top left of the graph editor to jump back out. Now I'm not going to explain exactly how they created this effect because honestly, I still don't understand it. But that's okay. All we need to do is blend this together with the red panda texture. Let's try a multiply node and output that to the color of the shader. So the multiply effect darkens it too much and the point of this effect is that it's shiny and it changes colors. Let's try an add node instead. And that looks much better. So now we have the red panda texture with the iridescence effect slapped on top. Well, that about wraps it up. I hope this tutorial was helpful in giving you a bit more information about the material editor in Lens Studio, and I hope that you learned a little bit more about shaders. You can create some really amazing effects using shaders, and this will really beef up the quality of your lenses. So get out there and start trying different node combinations. Try adding a posturization effect to your textures, or try using the fluctuate node to animate back and forth between values. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment. Happy creating, everyone! If you enjoyed that video or even learned something new, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you'd like to learn more about Lens Studio, go check out their channel for even more tutorials!